FLM, wide open thinking, world-class work, and far-reaching results. Now with locations in Minneapolis, Columbus, Indianapolis, and Washington, D.C. A strategic marketing and communications company dedicated to serving clients who specialize in the business of agriculture and the life of rural communities. Senator Jerry Moran from the great state of Kansas, thank you for joining us. Spencer, it's, it's good to be with you and with our viewers. Thank you. Well, for starters, I know a Kansas agriculture is a huge industry. What can you tell us is something unique that we might not know about the agricultural industry in the state of Kansas? Well, I certainly don't want to demean any particular commodity. We're thought of as a wheat state and we grow a lot of wheat, but we're also the grain sorghum state, more grain sorghum than any state in the country. Uh, we're clearly the livestock state uh, and much of what we grow is consumed in Kansas as we produce uh, meat for uh, not only the, the state, the country, and the world. So uh, it, it's things that people know, but sometimes uh, even Kansans forget about the role that agriculture plays. In addition to the economy that, that agriculture, uh, that, that industry provides, it's also a way of life for many Kansans, and it's influenced our state from before statehood. Uh, really determines who we are as a people, is that relationship to the land. Now you serve as the chair of the subcommittee for Senate Agricultural Appropriations. Now when you were first informed of that position, what were some of the things that you wanted to accomplish in, in that title? You know, I served in the House of Representatives before serving in the United States Senate, and there I was on the House Agriculture Committee for most of that time. I uh, chaired the, uh, the subcommittee on general farm commodities and risk management, so all farm programs, crop insurance, risk management tools. Uh, and I missed those days. Uh, because of the rules of the Senate, I was unable to do that. Uh, couldn't serve on the Senate Agriculture Committee when I came here. But we decided there was a great opportunity for somebody who cares about rural America, somebody who is interested in farmers and ranchers, uh, to be uh, on the Ag Appropes Committee, to be a member of the Appropriations Committee, and then to be a member of that subcommittee that deals with USDA and FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And uh, it was a great moment in my time in the United States Senate when, in a sense, so quickly, uh, in my first term, uh, become the chairman of uh, a subcommittee that has huge consequences uh, to the way we earn a living and to uh, a way that we live our lives uh, in the state of Kansas. And while I recognize my job as a senator is, uh, certainly has national implications, we worry about America and Americans. Uh, my primary motivation for seeking office in the first place now a few years back was a belief in rural America. And it was really a sense of what can I do to make sure that uh, the communities across my state, uh, the people who earn their living uh, in our state of Kansas have a future. And most importantly, how do we make certain that there's another generation of Kansans who have the chance to raise their kids uh, on the places, uh, in the places that Kansans call home across our state. And so uh, being back in a sense front and center with agriculture was, uh, it, it was one of those kind of high five moments uh, that uh, is, is really, it's a blessing and an opportunity. Now it's very common in the appropriations process, as I'm sure you know, to address maybe some unpopular policy issues through appropriations riders, through funding measures. In agriculture, this might be something like Waters of the U.S., the Dietary Guidelines, things mm -hmm. of that nature. Why approach policy in this fashion? Well, it's not the, I, I wouldn't think that's our first choice. Sometimes it's necessary. You know, the, the Agriculture Committee is, res, is responsible for the substantive policy decisions that affect agriculture, agriculture producers. But from time to time, uh, because of the need to do something quickly, and because of the difficulty we have in passing substantive legislation uh, in the Senate, in the Congress, uh, sometimes that responsibility then falls to uh, the appropriations process. A reason that happens is that there's no question but what an appropriation bill has to pass Congress be signed into law by the president every year. That's where we have this conversation about a potential shutdown of government. I mean, what the, what the story there is that by September the 30th of every year, uh, the fiscal year ends and we should have done our appropriations work to fund the federal government into the new fiscal year. And I hope that happens more often than it has in the past. In the absence of that, we have to pass some other appropriation measure could be an omnibus spending bill which covers a whole array of uh, putting all the appropriation bills or many of them together. 
Uh, it could be a continuing resolution in which we fund the federal government at last year, the current year's level into the future. Uh, but at some point in time, some kind of appropriation bill has to pass the Congress and be signed into law by the president. Otherwise, you have government coming to a, a shutdown. And so that puts a lot of pressure on the Appropriations Committee to deal with issues that sometimes can't get floor time, can't find consensus in the committee, uh, in this case, the Agriculture Committee. Uh, and so the responsibility then falls to us to kind of pick up the pieces, knowing that that bill is gonna be signed by the president. And so, you know, we, in, in my view, we wanna use that uh, appropriately. Uh, we wanna give great deference to the, to the Ag Committee. They get the first shot at trying to accomplish this. But in conjunction with working with the Ag Committee and others, the leadership of the Senate and the House, from time to time, we're gonna play the, the responsible role of getting something done because it needs to be done and it can't wait. And one of the issues that uh, came up throughout the agricultural appropriations process this year was the Food Safety Modernization Act and the White House requesting a level of funding much higher than what they're uh, anticipating receiving. And so there's been a lot of talk about how it's important to fully fund the Food Safety Modernization Act for all these changes to be put into place. Will FISMA receive full funding? Well, first of all, I should probably should explain that the Ag Appropriations Subcommittee's jurisdiction is most of the spending, the spending at the Department of Agriculture, USDA. In addition to that, it's the Food and Drug Administration, which really isn't a component of USDA, but that, that expands our jurisdiction, and certainly what happens in food safety has a huge consequence on agricultural producers, the agricultural businesses of our country. Uh, and so FDA is a significant component of what we do. And a number of years ago, Congress uh, changed the law, modernized food safety. The goal in that modernization is to not to react to a problem, uh, not to penalize or fine a business for making a mistake, but rather to get out front of how a business conducts its operations to prevent uh, a foodborne illness from occurring. All of that makes a lot of sense, uh, but changing uh, has some financial consequences and the President's budget requests uh, an additional $109 million for uh, implementation of this new law. Uh, our appropriations uh, uh, subcommittee recommended and the full committee agreed to about, I don't know, nearly half of that amount. Uh, and we're gonna continue to work to see if we can find the additional dollars necessary even for our agriculture, I mean, we certainly don't want a consumer uh, harmed, their health hampered, uh, life and death threatened uh, as a result of a food safety issue. And so this is an important uh, policy issue. It's an important uh, uh, safety issue. It's also important to our producers because even the rumor of a food safety problem can cause prices to plummet, can cause businesses to be closed, uh, demand for a certain uh, commodity to be reduced. Uh, and so this FDA aspect of what we do is critical, uh, certainly to the well-being of Americans, but also to the well-being of those who produce and manufacture processed food. And so it's a high priority for us to make certain that the necessary resources are at FDA. The problem that we're dealing with at the moment is that the amount of money we have to spend within our jurisdiction of the Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee is less this year than it was last year. So it means we have to prioritize, and that, in my view, that's exactly what an appropriations committee is supposed to do. Spend more money here, same money here, no money here, less money here. And those are the decisions that we need to make based upon the input that we have in hearings, uh, in reports from the administration, uh, from uh, you know, our constituents, uh, and from the experts who come and testify before Congress. And I would guess that we'll be able to do more uh, in regard to, to FDA and FISMA implementation but I think what we await now is what happens with an overall budget agreement that may increase the allocation that our subcommittee and the other 11 subcommittees have. Another so-called Ryan Murray plan uh, is certainly being considered that would then allow us to go back and reprioritize based upon just a few more dollars coming the way of our Appropriations Committee for Agriculture and for FDA. So it remains to be seen. Um, it's a priority, but there's lots of things within uh, our jurisdiction that's a priority, and we'll be doing that balancing, and it'll be a matter of working with all members of our subcommittee to try to find where there's consensus about uh, where additional dollars can be spent if they're given to us uh, by the budget process. 
And shifting gears a little bit here and talking about you personally, you mentioned your experience in the U.S. House. Before that, you were in the Kansas State Senate. Um, so you've been in some form of public service since 1989, the last 26 years. Throughout that time, what have you learned? Well, I mean, what I hope uh, that I've learned is that uh, I have a responsibility to my constituents, to those who elected me in each one of those instances to try to make a difference on their behalf, that this job is not about me, it's about them. It's uh, a, a reminder that uh, the question that, that I always want to be asking is, how can I help? What can I do to be of benefit? Uh, and I've learned that it's important for policymakers to, uh, to put the long term ahead of the short term. Uh, too often politics is about the next election and what I hope policy is about, what I hope that uh, the work that a Congress does, that I do as a member of the United States Senate, is uh, what's good for the next generation. Ultimately the goal here is to make certain that good things happen in America. Uh, in my case, good things happen in rural America. And those are not decisions that are made on a week-to-week -week basis or a month-to-month -month or election-to-election. -election. Those are things that matter long term. And ultimately, as I said earlier, the goal is to make certain that uh, our kids uh, have the chance to raise their kids, their families, in the places that we all grew up, in the places that Kansas and rural Americans call home. Now, in, in the past couple of years that you've been serving in the United States Senate, when you go back home to Kansas and talk to your constituents, are those conversations getting a little bit more difficult as we look at things like a government shutdown that could possibly be around the corner, the one that actually did happen in 2013? Is it getting harder to, to talk to some of your constituents about things that are going on in Washington? Spencer, it's, it's never difficult to talk to my constituents. It's never difficult to listen to my constituents, and we do it regularly. I go home uh, almost without exception every weekend, unless there's business here in Washington, D.C. I'm back in Kansas uh, as a House member, 69 town hall meetings, one in each county of that congressional district every year. I'm now on my third trip around the state. We have 105 counties, so it's my third trek of 105 town hall meetings. Those conversations take place in that kind of setting, but it's also a visit to a school, a business, a civic club. It's church on Sunday, grocery store, post office. Uh, those conversations are an important part of how I look at what I do. Uh, and what I'm, you know, what I, what I receive uh, in every conversation is another dose of Kansas common sense, good judgment, so that I can make better decisions. And I think that you know there are a few issues in which Kansans would say, don't budge, uh, don't give up on your principles, and then a number of circumstances in which people would say, let's work together and get something done. And I think my job is to try to figure out what are those few issues uh, that, that I face, that we face here in Washington, D.C., that you can't, you can't budge on your principles, and what's the vast majority of things in which you've got to figure out how to work with urban, suburban folks. One of the things I know as a member of Congress from a state like Kansas is that I'm a member of a minority. Uh, people here don't understand, don't appreciate, and many instances don't care about what goes on in the places that, uh, that I represent. And so I've got to figure out how to connect with people who come from much different places, much different backgrounds, totally different priorities. And that requires a, a, a level of cooperation between uh, all of us you know, I, I, I've, I've said this numerous times going back to my days in the house where I come from economic development is often whether or not there's a grocery store in town. And almost no one in Washington DC knows why that would ever be an issue. And it's that kind of outreach that we've got to make certain uh, continues to occur so that we can have some accomplishments. So I, th I think the message that, to, that I hear is, is, can you work together and get some things done, but don't give up your principles. And I think the other thing that, that's changed, I mean, I, I've had you know, more than a thousand town hall meetings in which uh, people for an hour come tell me what's on their mind county by county. And over time, it's become much, a much greater concern about the direction of the country. Uh, it's more about, um, Jerry, I'm worried about my kids and grandkids and what life is gonna be like for them here in our country. There's a great, fear, a, a concern about the direction the country is going and what it means to our kids. And so it's no longer, you know, there, there's nothing selfish about uh, those conversations. It's moms and dads who are worried about kids and grandkids, and it's the reminder again that this is about the long haul. How do we put ourselves in a position in which uh, the freedoms and liberties our country was founded on through the Constitution are guaranteed, continue to be available to American citizens? 
and how do we make sure that everybody has the chance to pursue the American dream? Those are great things, and I continue to be optimistic that uh, you know, with God's guidance and with uh, goodwill among members of Congress and the American people, we can continue to move this country in a direction that's beneficial to all. Kansas Senator Jerry Moran, thank you for joining us. Thank you.